Welcome back. This is World Class Stamp, part three with Carlton Palmer, where we'll be talking about his post footballing player career. Remember to like and subscribe, leave a comment, and we'll get back to you. Do you think um, Sheffield Wednesday can stay up in, in the championship? It's very, very tight at the bottom this season. Well, well to be fair, uh, Danny's done a, an unbelievable job since he's come in with the players that he's got in the situation. I mean, they'd up, up until last night, they'd run five games out of six. Yeah. Um, he's got them very organised, very disciplined. Um, you know, the, the, my worry was these, these next two games that they had, uh, they needed to get something out of the next two games. But it's going to go down to the wire. Mm -hmm. It's going to go right down to the wire. Um, it, it's, it's, you know, Rotherham have gone. I think Stoke will go. And I think it's between Sheffield Wednesday and Uddersfield do go. Mm -hmm. Millwall have just got a couple of results now. I think they'll nick another result that will make them safe. QBR but, have climbed up a little bit, haven't yeah, they? But, and, they're, and they're playing well. So the two form teams at the bottom are, are QPR and Sheffield Wednesday. Um, so I think both of those teams will get out. And I think it'll probably be, like I said, Rotherham have gone. Uh, and I think uh, Stoke and maybe, I mean, Uddersfield have a, a, a nicked a result of Stoke, but I still think they're going to get dragged back into it. But yeah. it, 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 it's going to go right to the way. It's going to go right to the way. And to, 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 to actually... Um, be in the position to take that to the way. I mean, there were nine points of drift, Sheffield Wednesday. I, I, I yeah. thought, you know, 10 games ago, they were dead and buried. So to get it this mm. close, um, and, the, and, and and what is it? Uh, you've got four teams on 38 points yeah. and two teams on 39 points. So it's going to go right to the way. They brought in Ike Ugbo, uh previous on loan at Cardiff at the start of the season uh, from Troy is on loan. Um, he seems to... Um, from what I've, because I'm, I'm a Cardiff fan, so I saw it in the first half of the season. Um, he kind of just stays in between the goalposts and he, he's he's a great finisher. Um, I think he suits Sheffield Wednesday's play style more. And if you think if he gets enough service, I think he'll have enough to get a pinch a few goals. What, what have you kind of um, took from him coming into the side? Do you think um, he's got enough to keep um, Sheffield Wednesday up with, with a few goals? Well, the players that he, they've brought in. Um you know the winger they brought in from Leeds United. He, you know they, it's 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 a funny place here for Wednesday. Like, it really is. Players that are, have not played well at other clubs come to Sheffield Wednesday, and they, it's it, it, the pitch is lovely. It, it, it's 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 a fantastic stadium. The supporters are absolutely immense, and players, you, you know, like they just gravitate towards the supporters, and the supporters gravitate. And he's one of those that supporters have taken to him. Um, he, he's scoring goals. He's he's running the line. He's holding the line very very well for Sheffield Wednesday. Um, you know, and they they're going to have to score goals to get out because their goal difference is poor. They're going they're going to have to do that. Um, but um, I like Danny Rowell. I, I, I like what he's done, and uh, they brought he's brought in Chris Powell as part of his backroom staff. Mm -hmm. They're very very organised. They know what they're doing. They're going to be, even against Leeds United, uh, you know, they narrowly got beat against a very, very good Leeds United side. I mean, Dan, Dan, Daniel Fart's done, he's a very, very good manager. I mean, he's got Norwich out of that league twice at a canter, so he knows what he's doing. Um, uh, I, I forget who they play next, but um, it's, it's another big game away from home. Um, and they need, uh, they, need, they need to get a result against their, uh, you know, they need to nick a result from one of those big boys to get out of it. Mm -hmm. You know, they need a re result. You know, you're at 38 points now. You would think you're going to need 46, 47. Yeah, it's usually around 50 points in the championship, yeah. isn't it? Yeah, but I think 47, <laughs> you're going to be all right. So it's where they're going to get that other, you know, six or seven points from. Yep. Um, the gap between the championship and the premiership, you've seen like... Uh, Burnley, they absolutely destroyed the championship last year. You got up into Premier League, thirteen points. Obviously, Sheffield United, we, we maybe talked about earlier. Um, you come in and good, did a great job. But other factors there were where you know they sold their best player or one of the best players, Sanderberg, to to Burnley, which seemed a strange decision and didn't really strengthen. Um, and Luton are making a real fist of it. They've, they've signed some good, made some good signings with um, Barkley. And uh, they got a couple of lads up front who are scoring um, goals up there. Do you, do you feel like, um, and and obviously looking at championship this year as well, top 
three of the top four sides are the sides come down from the Premier League. Mm. Um, what can what can be done to kind of make it a little bit more um, competitive? Because obviously they get the parachute payments and stuff. Because um, it seems like um, most of the championship sides don't really have much a chance against the, the teams coming down from the Premier League. Yeah, well, do you know what it is? It's about it's about long term planning, isn't it? It's about yeah. long term planning and developing your own players and bringing them through. That's what it is. Um, not just waiting until you get promoted. I mean, I think Burnley are where. I, Listen, I, I think Vincent Company has done a fantastic job since he's been there, but the, the way they've played this season, it's you're not going to get away with playing like that. I watched them the other day. You're not going to get away with playing like that in the Premier League. It's too open. He, he wants to play that style of play, and he hasn't got the players to play it, and that's been proven. It's just it's just not it's not going to happen. And I think they've they've gone with the fact that they've they they want to they'll, they'll get relegated, and the squad they've got will probably bounce straight back. A lot of Clubs use that kind of uh, process because it is massive between the the Championship and the Premier League. But Burnley have spent a lot of money. Um, you know, um, it, it, Vincent's got his uh, principles of the way he wants to play. But when you get in the Premier League, you, those principles have to go out the window. It's about getting results. It's a results-based industry. Mm. Um, you know, as you said, the teams that go down, obviously, they've got the parachute money. So, therefore... You know they're going to be vying to get back in 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 into the Premier League. I mean, you're going to have, um, you know, two of those teams. Whoever don't, you know, at the moment you've got Ipswich at the top. You've got uh, Leeds in second. Then you've got Southampton, and, and yeah. then you've yeah, and then you've got Leicester. So two of those teams are going to be in the playoffs. So mm -hmm. one's going to miss out. Yeah, it's yeah. a real strong championship this year. I will say oh, top yes. four uh, streets ahead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very well, we got yeah. West Brom and, and Hull. Yeah, but, it, but it's been a, it's been it's been a competitive. Like if you look look down the table in in the likes of West Brom, uh, Carlos Kuber has done a fantastic job at West mm. Brom. You know, uh, Norwich have, have have been there and thereabouts. They're just on the outskirts of of that. Um, so I think it's been a it's been a, a very very competitive um, uh, division. Um, when you're looking at the bottom. For there's seven teams, eight teams who possibly still could get relegated, and and then you look at the likes of Watford, who, you know, um, I'd be very, very surprised if he's, you know, Ishmael's still in work, you know, mm. because you know the way they work and they're yeah. they're off the well off 12, 13 points off the playoffs. Yeah, they started pretty well, Watford, didn't they? Yeah. They fell away. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so we're gonna move into some current hot topics now yeah. in, in the in the press, media, football punditry world. That's FFP, that's VAR, European Super League. Let's start with um, VAR. What's your view on VAR and how it's evolved since it's come in? And is it going to? Uh, it's, it's, it, for me, it's not. It's not enhanced the game in any way, shape, or form. Um, like I, I like because I'm a black and white person. I like things very, very simple. And the talking points. All over the years, as a as a supporter, as a footballer, there's always going to be some decisions that go for you, and some decisions go back for you. I struggle in my mind to think of a decision that has been made before VAR came in that's cost a team a cup final or a league. If you win a league, you win it because you've been the most consistent team over the course of the season. If you mm -hmm. get relegated get relegated because you've been poor over the course of the season. One decision doesn't cost you either. So therefore, there will be decisions that go. So now, you know, I, I, I don't know, you know, a player scores, doesn't know whether to celebrate. A player's offside, the linesman doesn't put up uh, his flag. It's just, and then a player's chasing back, could pick up an injury. It's just created a more de indecision than there was before. So it's not for me. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I think you could, you know, the goal line technology, fine. I haven't got a problem with that. You know, that's very conclusive. It's very easy to to do. Um, and what it's done, I, I think what VAR's done is allowed referees to uh, uh, not referee the game. So any decision that they don't think is right, they leave it to VAR. Instead of them making the decisions. If it's a penalty, it's a penalty. I see things that are penalty. And ball's and ball. Is it deliberate and ball? Is it not? Right? If it's deliberate and ball, you see, you give it. End of story. You know, but what referees are doing now, it, oh, leave it to VAR. 
yeah, yeah. yeah. I agree. I think the goal line technology improved the game. Was yeah. it a goal? Because we've seen some big games in the past uh, be lost by sides who should have technically won. Um, yeah. So I think the goal line technology was an improvement. Yeah. VAR is in respect to offsides. 99 or 95 percent of the time that's an improvement yeah. for all this objective and subjective views from another box off the pitch that's got to be scrapped for me it's it, it has it's just well they won't scrap it because there's too much money being spent on it but it's it, it, it you know i mean like for me now i look at this it's very very simple that they're, t- they're talking about cards and simbings coming in if if a player is uh shows dissent you give him a yellow card. Shows dissent again, you give him another yellow card. You will stamp out dissent to referees and officials. What, done. Why don't they do that? Because I've thought uh, decades and decades watching the game. If it's within a minute of each other, yellow, yellow. Yeah, yeah, that's it. You swear at the referee, you abuse the referee, you abuse the linesman, you go put your hands on the referee, you put the hands on the linesman, yellow card, do it again. That's it. Forget Simbins, forget anything. That's it. That's eradicated. It's done, it's finished. It's finished. You know, it, 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 all, it, they're just complicating the game for the sake of it. Do you know what I mean? Just keep it, keep it simple. So, yeah. <coughs> sorry, on VAR, do you want to move on to... Yeah, um, so uh, financial fair play, and um, we've seen um, Everton being deducted points, um, and then they've gone back and they've, they've, they've added a few back on. Um, and there's potentially... Nottingham Forest as well. They they could be in a bit of trouble with their spending. Um, and Leicester. Yeah. And, Le- Leicester. Yeah. and Leicester. That's yeah. the one, and, it, yeah. and then Man City. I mean, they've got 150 charges <laughs> against Manchester City. You think some of them are going to stick, aren't they? Yeah. yeah. That's, I, was, like, I mean, once they've already won the Premier League, if they go back and say, oh, well, we'll duck and docking new points from um, you know previous seasons, and that means Liverpool get a few extra titles or whatever it is, um, the players have already lifted the trophy. They've had the moment, and it's robbed the players who have, you know, they put they like you said earlier, only within one point of missing out on the title, and then you know they've they've been kind of a financially. Um, sort but why has it got to that stage? Why I don't get how it gets to that stage. Surely, yeah. surely it should be all monitored by the football league as to as and when the clubs are spending money. All the clubs are audited. They're yep. audited on a regular basis. I know David Regis, who who works for the FA, and that he goes into clubs and he and they do the audit at football clubs. So why has it got to this stage where you know I, I was listening to the manager of Wolves the other day, and he's absolutely right. You know, you, you, you know he's battling for his life to keep the Wolves in the Premier League, but he doesn't know where they are in the Premier League because he doesn't know whether there's potential that uh, Forest might get points deduction, that Everton might get. Points deduction, they might be given points back. So he doesn't know where his team is in the league. It's a false position. So at the end of the day, I don't understand how, you know, that during, you know, the course of like pre season or whatever or the transfer windows, then surely these clubs should be monitored at yeah. that time of when they're spending. And if they breach the re- rules at that time, then the, the points should be deducted. At that time, yeah, yeah. it should yeah. be right. Season's about to start. Let's check your books. Yeah. Right, you're all clean. You're right, clean slate. Off you go. Yeah, not exactly. deducting and points, then, adding points. It's just a mess. It is it's an absolute mess. And yeah. everybody knew that Everton were going to get uh, some points back. It was, it was it was said from the start that they get, but now they're saying they might be deducted some more points. Should yeah. we have FFP? Like, if you think in the commercial world with business, the better businesses just do better because they make better decisions. So. Shouldn't that work in the same way as football? No, no, you've got to have fair play. I mean, it's like it's like for me now. I don't watch Formula One. Why? Because Formula One now is not about who's the best driver. It's about who's got the best car. We'd all like to see everybody on a level playing field. There yeah. you go. You've all got the same car. Wasn't it more exciting? Let's see who the best driver is, right? Yeah. Same in football. Level playing field. Level playing field, right? Let's see who the best coach is here. Right, I still believe Pep Guardiola would be the best coach. A Jurgen Klopp would still be there because he's proven. He's proven where they've been before, right? But let's let's keep it a level playing field so it's fair. It's got to be fair for the teams that are coming up in terms of their spending, 
and whatever, and let's keep it fair. I mean, like this year, I mean, you know, you've got three teams challenging for the Premier League title. And then you've got, you know, it, so it keeps the balance of the, of the league right. You know, you can't just have a rich benefactor coming in like Todd Bowley and saying, right, do you know what? I'm going to chuck so much money out. I'm going to buy the league. Nobody wants to see that. It gets a bit boring yeah. that way, doesn't it? Yeah. So, yeah. Okay, we're going to ask uh, Carl, and what are you up to now? And uh, what work are you involved in at the moment? And what, what are you doing in general, day-to-day -day, uh, life? Well, I'm retired now. I mean, I always planned that I would retire um, around 55. That was always my plan. Um, and the reason for that was I've got a lot of... You, you, people don't realise that when you're playing football, I've played football since a, a young kid, um, you don't get to do a lot of things. You don't get to travel and do... It, you, your life is consumed about football. And don't... Com I, I'm not complaining. It gives you a fantastic life and whatever. I've been to some, some great places playing football, but I've just been there. Because when you're playing football, you know, we go to Sweden to play in the European Championships. We're not there to sightsee. Do you know what I mean? We're there yeah, to work. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. You know, so so the plan was that I was going to retire young and, and travel. So I retired at, at, at 57. So I'm retired now. Um, what do I do? I, I, I um, spend a lot of time in Portugal playing golf. Um, I look after my wife. She, she's a school teacher. She likes... She, she wants to um, continue working and I've said to her she you should she's younger than me she you should continue until you're ready if you enjoy what you're doing you should continue until you're ready to stop I, I, I enjoy playing football I love playing football I can't play no more so that's why I don't do anything else so I do that I, I work in the media if the right thing comes up for me um, like I was in Kuala Lumpur last week working for Astro TV if the right thing comes up for me and it's the right time then I do that uh, I did an after dinner in Wigan the other night so I'd like to do the dinners on the Friday night go out and talk football you know raise money for the, the uh, local like last night was for a local cricket club in Wigan raise money for the, you know the youngsters to play sports so I enjoy that I've got um, four children and three grandchildren and another one on the way um, you know, and so uh, yeah, I mean, my life's, you know, I, funny enough, my dad's, my dad's got uh, dementia, and um, you know, uh, he, he's eighty, he's going to be eighty nine on the twenty first of March, uh, God willing, he gets there, and it's interesting. He said to me, um, uh, not so long back, he, he said to me, "Listen, Colton, I, I don't want you to feel sad for me." He said, and, and I don't want anybody to shed a tear when I'm gone. He said to me, you know, I'm in a position in life where I've done everything I've ever wanted to do. He said, I'm very, very content. And he said, do you know, that's the position you should be in when it's time to pass on. I'm in that position now. Yeah. I'm in that position to, now. I've got nothing more to achieve in life. Nothing more I want to do in life apart from enjoy now, the fruits of my hard labour, you know, we're off to, Lucy and I are off to South Africa in, uh, on the 21st, of, on the 28th of March for three weeks, something I've always wanted to do. Uh, we're going to go and do a safari, we're going to go and uh, Robin Hood's, you know, see where Nelson, Nelson Mandela was, you know, even though I've been to South Africa twice playing football, we never, I never got that opportunity. So we, every year, we, you know, we, we're doing our bucket list of, of travelling and, 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 and enjoy life and and, and, and lucky enough, you know, that I have uh, um, the time now to do the things. And, and, and it, it might sound silly to, to people out there, but do things like, you know, um, I get up in the morning every day when Lucy leaves work at quarter seven. I, I'm at the house at quarter seven, so I'll train for an hour and a half. And then, and then I come back, I put the music on and I cook, I prepare tea, which is, you know, something I never had the time before. I get the music on, cook tea, yeah. even things like, you know, washing the two cars, you know, get out and, you know, cause if you clean the car properly, it's, it's, it's a three hour job. Do you know what I mean? Clean. Yeah. So yeah. I, you know, and, 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 and before I know it, Lu Lucy's ringing me at, at quarter to five, leaving work. And I'm thinking, Jesus, I'm not stopped. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And it's great to yeah. be able to, to be in that position, like I've said, um, I do enjoy the football and would I do media work, more Ouija work? Yes, I would. But I don't want to be, right now, I don't want to be contracted to mm -hmm. um, 
anybody because I wanted to have that freedom to do, you know, like last week, I just wanted to go to Portugal and play golf with a few of my mates for four days and that's what I did, you know. Uh, and I have that ability to do that now. So I want the flexibility to do that, but I do enjoy... Uh, the football and the commentating. I've no wish to go back into football in management or coaching. I've I've done that. Um, so now, yeah, no, I, I plan to. I did plan to run the half marathon and the marathon this year again for charity. But unfortunately, uh, the half marathon is when Lucy and I are in South Africa. So I think Lucy and I are going to run the uh, um, the ten k in Sheffield in September, and then I look to do. Uh, a marathon in the in the in the new year. That that's uh, what I plan to do for charity. Um, so yeah, and what sort of times you pull in in your marathon running? Well, no, in in the marathon, I actually uh, because in the half marathon, I, I had an heart attack in okay. Sheffield, um, which I, I think was from the COVID jab. I had the COVID jab two days before, so I had a small heart, heart attack. So on the way. Yeah, yeah, Ugh. yeah. I, mm. yeah, well, it's, I, it, to be honest with you, I should, you know, like Lucy said, I mean, we didn't even think about it. I mean, mm. I had the COVID jab two days before and you're going to run an half marathon. It doesn't make sense, does it, really? Um, and I, I think that caused a problem. So I, I, in that, I, I knew in myself that it was from the, the, the COVID jab. So I ran the, uh, I wanted to run the marathon three weeks later, the, the, the London marathon. So I run, and I was going really, really well. I pulled my hamstring about 13, 14 miles in, but I still did it in, uh, I think, just five hours, even then, because I had to walk quite a lot of the way, but I was going to wow. complete it. Um, yeah, so my, my aim is to, to run the marathon. I, I think I could run the marathon in, I, 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 I would run. I did the half marathon, even with uh, having an heart attack in 2.12. I could run the half marathon. I generally run about uh, one fifty one, So I think I could do 4.30. So that's my, my aim for next year, to do uh, a marathon in, in, in 4.30. That's that's the plan. Oh, good luck yep. there. Um, <laughs> you, you also mentioned that uh, you're possibly doing another book. Obviously, you've got the book there. Yeah. It is what it is. And yeah. can you tell us just a, a little bit more about that? So if people want to pick yeah, up. Yeah, no, I've been approached uh, about doing another book. And, uh, you know, there's, there's several topics that have been thrown at me. And one of them is, is about how footballers uh, or, or sportsmen beco become lost with, you know, like I was speaking about Kel uh, Brook at the moment. Uh, he's lost now because that's all he's ever done. That's all he ever knows what to do. And it's it's very hard when you 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 don't plan for that after you know life after the sport, especially when you finish in our sport, we finish so young. Uh, Niall Quinn's missus did a book, and she was talking about Niall and how he was when he finished playing football, and 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 it was and 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 she uh, eloquently puts it in the book, and it's true. You can't what what you can't do is you can't go for 30 years of your professional, of your life as an athlete, being single-minded, being pushed to the levels that you have been and just become a normal person in society. We're not normal people. Like I said, there's very few of us, 2,775 in a population of 64 million. We are not normal people. I'm different to you. What I'm prepared to do, there's a lot of talented players out there. There are a lot of talented players out there. But there's a difference between talented players and having the bollocks and the mentality to take it to another level. Yeah. That's different. That's something that's inside of you as a footballer. So therefore, when you come out of the game, you then wanted to go into normal society where you've not lived in normal society. Yeah. You know, we have everything done for us. You know, we turn up when I turn up a football match, I turn up with my toilet bag. You know, my boots are there, my kit's there, everything's there. All I do is turn up in the toilet back, mentally prepared to play a game of football, yeah. Yeah. right? So then you've come out of it now, all of a sudden, now you've got to arrange your own holidays, you've got to arrange your own this, you've got to, and then you come into normal society. You're not, no, we're not normal, and I know I'm not normal, so therefore I don't live a normal life. You know, people say to me, you, you train an hour and a half every day, yet yeah, because that starts my day off, and if I don't do it, then I'm always looking back at myself. You know, you see a lot of sportsmen who finish who 
put on a lot of weight because obviously when they've been playing, they, they've had to keep an hold on it. But that's the wrong thing to do because then all of a sudden they don't feel good about themselves. You know, part of me doing what I'm doing is I like to feel good when I put my clothes on and, and do whatever. So it's all that mental psyche of, so I've been approached about doing a book about how I cope with it and, and what I did to uh, deal with life after football and, and how I've developed my life after football. But I always had a plan. I always knew there would be a day that I wouldn't play football. And I've been lucky that I've had people around me. Like I said, I haven't had a lot of friends, but I, I, I've got people around me who are always saying to me, right, you've got to have a plan. You've always got to have a plan. And up until two years ago, when I retired, I've always had a plan. Now I don't need a plan. There's no plan. Mm. The plan is now to in, enjoy life and in, enjoy, you know, every time Lucy works in a private school, so she great has great holidays. As soon as she has a holiday, I'm like... Uh, booking up I'm a year in advance so you know we're, we're, we know what we're doing up until Christmas you know we know Lucy's dad lives in Connecticut so we're going to go uh, to New York and Connecticut and Boston for it there yeah. and then in between team times we go to our house in Portugal Lucy's going to learn golf so we're going to go and play golf <laughs> together we're going to cycle in Portugal it's beautiful honestly where we live in Portugal it's beautiful cycling we want to you know and the thing in Portugal as well you've got great big cycling lanes so it's mm. brilliant for you it's so safe to yeah. be able to so it's about planning and these the, these players you know what they've got need to think about is there is life after football so many of the footballers get divorced because there's you know they get to the end now and what's left to do so they end up in the pub drinking you know and that's the one thing I said I've always liked to drink but that's one thing I've said I'm, I'm never going to do that so I I go to the pub every day because I need to be social but I, I don't drink during the week Right, so it's just on the weekend. So during the week, I'll go and have a black currant and lemon, unless I fancy a pint. If I fancy a pint, I have a pint, mm. but I don't get into that habit. I just go for a social about four o'clock till my missy finish work to quarter five, then get home and get the tea on. And that's what you got to do because it's easy to get into the bookies when you got the money. It's easy to go into the bookies. It's easy to go to the pub. And then you've got plenty of people who will sit there drinking with you and see the spending, and then it spirals. Then it spirals, and you've got to, you've got to have that that that. Um, and it's very difficult for players because I, I and I won't speak out of term because I've had people players come on to me now who, who are who are just come out the game or looking to come out the game and there's only so many media jobs you know there's only yeah. so many places in media and you know for former players that's but you know like I've said to one guy now I said there's plenty of jobs abroad coaching you know India now they they want foreign coaches to come in there to pay good money you know you, you get. You know, your kids can go to the private school there and whatever. There's great opportunities, but you've got to take yourself out at that comfort zone yeah. Of, of, yeah. of what you're in. Uh, um, you know, so there's there's the, the, there's um, there's talk about. Uh, I'm, I'm going to sit down with a guy, and and I think it, 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 it'd be interesting to do that, uh, and then speak to players who I know who have, have really struggled. Do you know, and then you, you know, once you hit that road of you know, financially, you've got a problem. It's then very hard for footballers because footballers are not trained in anything else. Yeah, they're not trained in anything else. So that's when I, when my son was at Aston Villa and he was a good player and he wanted to go. I wanted him to get a degree first because I know how hard it is. And I said to him, "Listen, son, I said we're going to fall out about this, but you go and get your degree first, right?" He's got. He's now. He, he's now. When he got his degree, he's not. He's, he wasn't bothered because I. I knew you. You've got to be a different breed, like I've said, to do what you're doing. So I, he, he's now doing a masters in in cyber security, and he'll go on and do very well. But I didn't want him to waste his ability. Yeah, I, I, not that I didn't want him to follow his dreams, but have a backup. Yeah. You know, back in the day, you could have a backup because you could go and work. Now, what, what you know. It's not so easy to do that. You, you've got to have an education. And this is why Lucy asked me so many times to go into a school because the kids get signed up from a young age. I'm going to be a professional footballer. I'm going to, she said, can't come and speak to them because yeah. these clubs will sign you up and spit you out and chew you out as quickly as they sign you in. Yeah. No, well, definitely. I think that'd be excellent reading. Looking forward to it. Yeah, um, it'd be good to see how different, uh, after, you know, people you speak to or, or your, your view of how you um, sort of scratch that urge or that itch 
to maintain top level, uh, you know, at, at, at the sport. You know, I'm on football, not like I played at your level, but uh, I miss football after two weeks, so you want to try and get back in and play it is how you it's how you channel your energy basically yeah. isn't it it is it is a, a, you've got to have when you when you when you wake up in the morning every day i have got a plan something to do right now we're re- refurbing our house in portugal so i've got i'm on with you know doing stuff i've got a plan every morning i wake up there's a plan there's something in my diary to be done and i don't honestly i've been it's been nearly 3 years and i don't have enough time in the day and, it, <laughs> and it's it, it's a nice place to be in to be yeah. you know um you know you know to be sort of content and 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 happy in in what i'm doing and it's only little things that i'm doing that you think right well you know, people might laugh at that. You know, getting up in the morning and and and, and cleaning the car. I can easily take the car to. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but no, you know. So I suppose for you, what I'm hearing, it's all about constant daily self improvement, discipline, yeah, consistency, yeah, staying, taking, taking pride in, yeah, whatever yeah, you do. Yeah. Do, do, do you know what I mean? Too easy to you be. Do. You're cooking. You yeah. know, whether you're cleaning something, whether you're staying in shape, taking pride in in everything you do and and yeah. trying to. You know, keep that as as part of your routine and and part of your plan. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Yeah. Okay, we're going to finish up with uh, ten quick fire questions. Okay. Uh, just be respectful okay. of your time, and then uh, gonna, yeah. go first. I go first in this one, or yeah, do you want to go? For the yeah, last yeah. One okay. So uh, no, you talk about. Uh, I've seen a few of your posts as well on uh, X or Twitter. Um, yeah. Is Carlton Palmer a world class cook? I know you like your cooking. No, but he's getting better. <laughs> but he's getting better. He's getting better. He's getting better. I'm too slow. Like Lucy gives me, she said, like Lucy comes in and she could chop the onions and chop the, what's the name, like that. You know, she's, but it's like everything, isn't it? You know, I'm, I'm, I'm getting better at golf. I'm getting better at cooking. Okay. It takes time. <laughs> um, out of the managers in the Premier League at the moment, mm-hmm. you said uh, throughout your moves and you've moved to go to managers who would be um, your manager if you could play for anyone in the Premier League right now? Uh, who would you like to play for? I've got to be honest with you. I'd love to be, go and play for Jurgen Klopp. Yeah. What the players have told me, um, what I've seen about him, Pep would be too intense for me. You know, mm-hmm. uh, uh, no disrespect to Pep. Um, a lot of the players who played for him, they don't particularly like him. But he's a winner. Mm. And that's what comes from he's 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 incessant. He's in, you know boom boom it, boom boom. That'd be too much for me. But too much for me. I like I like I look at Jurgen Klopp and I look at him and I think boom I I, I could work for him. I look at Sir Alex Ferguson. At one point it, it was reported that he was in for me. I'd have loved to have gone and worked for Sir Alex Ferguson. Him and him and Howard Wilkinson were big big friends. Um, so and so I, I could imagine them being quite similar. So uh, I, I would have liked to have gone and worked for Salix if I'd ever had the opportunity. Yeah, okay. great. great. Um, you talked about your marathons, your running. What what bleep test score were you hitting? When you bleep were test sixteens uh, in your prime. In my primes, yeah, sixteens. Okay, great. easily, Please. easily. Yeah, you know. And and th- this is where I'm talking about modern day football. You know, I think uh, Scott Montominy at. Uh, at uh, Ben United, he's the top on the bleep test, and he's late. He's late sixteens. So, it, the, the, like the bleep test is is a, it, 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 it's it's universal as a as a level of fitness. Yeah. So that doesn't change in whatever era you you're running in. That doesn't change. Do you know what I mean? Of what able to do? Beckham was doing. 16 and a half, late 16 and a half, 17. He's one of the fittest players in the Premier League. That was then. So it doesn't change. That's that's the barometer of what you're able to do. Yeah, we had Neville Southall on uh, during the week and he said, is the speed of the game, and we mentioned earlier, has the speed of the game really changed since his playing days even? He agrees, I think. It's, it's, it's the same for every generation. For, for me, so. it is, yeah. It's minimal. Yeah. You're going, uh, who's your um, idol growing up? Football wise, or I don't, any well, well, I don't growing up. Um, obviously, I was a West Brom supporter, so I've grown up on uh, uh, um, Cyril Regis, Brendan Batson, Laurie Cunningham. Uh, my favourite player, uh, still to this day, still is Brian Robson, Pop Robson. I thought he was an unbelievable player. He really was. He could do everything: long passes, short passing, up and down. He was brave. He was just, he's just, and he's a fantastic bloke as well. 
He really is a fantastic bloke, but he's, he's a world class player. Yeah, is there anyone from today's game which you would love to play alongside if you could play into today's game, um, a particular midfield or or someone you just like to link up? Well, with? do you know? Do you know the one player who right now I, I've got a lot of admiration for, uh, and I've watched him a lot is the boy Declan Rice. Yeah, I really, I I, I really like him as a as a uh, person. I like the way he carries himself. Um, I thought he conducted himself outstandingly at West Ham. Um, and I thought West Ham conducting themselves outstandingly with the, with the way they looked after him and allow him mm -hmm. to go. Uh, I'm glad he chose to go to Arsenal than Man City. Um, you know, because it would have been easy just to go to Man City because they, they win all the time. Go to Arsenal with young players, with a young manager and see what can be done. And I've got, uh, I just think he's a phenomenal player and I think he'll go on to be one of the the best midfield players in the world in years to come. I mean, he's still only 24. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Great plenty player. of potential there, yeah. Um, who was your toughest opponent when you were playing? Toughest opponent in midfield, I would say, was Patrick Vieira. Toughest opponent at centre-back would be the old Ronaldo and wow, Thierry yeah. Henry. Yeah, some players there. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> top draw. Top draw, players there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, similar lines, what's your best moment in football? My best moment in football is walking out and making my debut for West Brom. Uh, even still today, mm. uh, not playing in cup finals, not playing for England. You know, it's a realisation of a dream of wanting to play professional football and to walk out uh, at the Hawthorns uh, for the club I supported. Uh, my house here, um, um, when I when I had it done, I had uh, the Hawthorns put in marble in uh, in in stone uh, uh, at the gates to go in, and and still to this day, it's the proudest moments in football. Um, and then my question is. Um out of um, all the away grounds you played at, was there like a favourite one where like you just, because there's, there's like some places where players turn up and they just, they feel the atmosphere, like, yeah, I'm going to have a really good game here. Was there like a, a place that you just felt like you can get your best performance out of a particular Always stadium? played well at Villa Park. Always played well at Old Trafford. Um, I mean, uh, Anfield on a, on a, a midweek night game is something special. Something mm -hmm. special. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and the old Wembley, the atmosphere at the old yeah. Wembley, when you're walking out there and there's 90,000 people, it's just uh, phenomenal. And, you know, sometimes, like I, like I said to you, it's, it's, I am only starting now um, because Lucy and I have been away for a long time and things have been in storage. I'm starting to get things out because my, my boy was younger at the time. He's now 25 now. I'm starting looking back at things. I never look back. But it's time now for me to look back, mm. and you know I, I, I have to pinch myself sometimes to think, you know, of you know we played the Sheffield Derby in the FA Cup semi final, ninety three thousand people at Wembley when Wadler scored that amazing goal. You know, um, I've been lucky enough to play at the New Camp. I've been uh, listen, like I said, if, if people want to criticise me, go ahead. It's not a problem to me. I, I pinch myself every day that I've been able to do and 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 play football. Uh, which, you, which you know, is you know, when you wake up on a, a Saturday morning, it's, there's no better feeling. Like for me, like I wake up on a Saturday morning uh, 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 to go and play football. It's like Jesus Christ. Yeah, so, okay. nice. yeah. 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 Um, a couple left then. So you're a pundit. There's loads of pundits out there. Um, who's the pundit that you enjoy listening to the most? That talks about the game well, assesses, analyzes it. I've got to be honest with you. There's very few. <laughs> <laughs> there's there's very few. Uh, uh, I, to, to be honest with you, I think Mika Richards has been a breath of fresh air on the right, on yeah. on on the TV. Um, I, 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 to be honest with you, I think Gary Neville and Jamie Carragher. I think they analyse the games very very well. I think they've done uh, very well there. I think Gary Neville speaks very well, and like I said, uh, I, I think Roy Keane's come across very well. He knows the game. Uh, He's obviously been a great player, and you know, I, you know, I'm, I wouldn't say he was my my favourite cup of tea when we played or whatever, but it's not about that. I think he he he, he, um, 
he, he dissects the game very well. Um, and I think Rio comes across very well as well uh, on TV. Um, but like I said, there's a, there's a few that sometimes have to turn the, <laughs> turn the volume down. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, I think uh, Neville Carragher, they've got good banter going on there, haven't they? As yeah. well yeah. on top with the old... Especially Mick Richards. Liverpool. Yeah. yeah. Mick Richards got so much charisma. It just comes yeah. through the screen. Yeah, he's You're good. like laughing along with It's good him, for TV. Good yeah, for yeah. TV, yeah. Yep, and then final question now. Final question. Well, we ask everyone, Carlton, uh, is there anybody else in uh, that you know that might want to come on the show? Well, I know a lot of people. It's just <laughs> <laughs> it's, it, listen, it's, it's, it's always difficult, you know. I, don't, I can't speak for other people about what they do and, and why they do it and whatever, but, you know, you, you, I can always point you in the right direction and, 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 and uh, you can always ask the question, can't you? Yeah, Cheers, yeah, mate. Isn't it? Yeah, okay, well, we, we appreciate your time today and uh, we'll be respectful of your time. Um, so we'll we'll wrap up the show there, but thank you very much for coming on and uh, just do the outro now. So um, thanks, everyone, for watching. Um, make sure if you like the in content, drop a like on the video. If you want to get involved in the debate, drop a comment in the comment section and subscribe to the channel to be notified for new episodes when they drop. But that's it for this time, guys. Have a world-class weekend and we'll catch you next time.